Hello, everyone. My name is Adrián. I'm from uh, Guatemala. Um, I'm a GDE on Android, Firebase, and IoT. And uh, I'm here to share a little bit about conversational interfaces. And the title make a reference to when this started. It's not something new. So uh, my, my slides are going to be available, already are available on that um, URL, in case you want to check, check it out. But um, let's get into business. So let's start with a very brief history lesson. Remember, in the 70s. Everything started around 1952. Um, there, was some, there, there was some work in Bell Labs, and Audrey uh, software was able to recognize a string of digits. This was like the, the start of everything. Although it seems like uh, something really easy in our days, at that time it was a breakthrough, recognizing the digits, uh, strings of digits. Um, and although things started in the 50s, it was until around the 70s where hidden Markov models were developed. This uh, helped a lot to recognize a speech and move away from pattern matching. This has happened several times in, in history. For a while, we tried to recognize things using patterns. That's like uh, one of the first steps. And then we find a way to move from pattern recognition into something not that uh, literal, let's say. And around the, the 70s also, several DARPA projects started to develop in this area. In the 80s, um, there was still a lot of uh, brute force pattern matching and template work, but also um, hidden Markov models became popular at last. It took uh, around 10 years for this to happen. And um, around mid-80s, in 1984, SpeechWorks was uh, one of the first software working on IVR. It, IVR is uh, when you call a um, call center and some computer uh, replies like, if you know the extension number, dial it, or press uh, zero for an operator. And it was until the 90s, four years later, that an, that an industry started. In 1997, Dragon, naturally speaking, was the first recognition software of continuous speech. This was a big breakthrough for the, for, for the industry. And in our days, 2007, Siri, Amazon Echo, Google Home, and here we are in, in 2018, where it's really common to use Google Assistant or Alexa or Siri or any assistant. And we are like in, in this phase where it's common to speak to our phones and wait for something to happen. We're going to cover several things, but the first one is going to be the design process. And I would like to ask a question I can, because of the light, I can barely see everyone, but I would like to know, how many of you are developers? Raise your hands. Almost all of the audience. UX designers? No one? Oh, just one hand in the back. Great. Um, marketing? No? OK, so I'm a developer, but uh, in this talk, I'm covering several UX design, um, several par parts of the UX design process. So the first step would be create a persona. Many of the things that I'm going to uh, be covering in the talk may, s may seem intuitive, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, we need to have a checklist when, when working with conversational interface. So the idea here is to identify the main traits of the user that's going to be using the, the conversation, who is going to be uh, talking with our app, and from there, keep um, doing more like a, a specific segments in order to uh, identify better and build this uh, profile of a persona. If you have ever worked with uh, branding or marketing, it's a common practice. However, in software development, it's not that common. And sometimes uh, it, it, um, it's easier 
for, for developers to like target a broad spectrum of users instead of the one group that's going to be using the app. Well, in this case, besides creating a persona, we need to focus on some specific traits. Because it's going to be a conversation, we need to focus on things like tone, style, technique, and voice. Even if we are using just one language, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a speak the same way everywhere. There are accents, there are words, there are uh, several things that change from region to region. And um, it's, it's funny, um, mostly from, from my experience, I've been privileged enough to travel a lot, mostly because of conferences, but um, there are several words that mean one thing, like literally, but have another meaning in another region. Happened to me a lot in Latin America when speaking in different countries. So keep in mind that we need to focus on all this, besides, of course, words and um, phrases. And the way in which we're going to uh, communicate with our user. A lot of uh, approaches here in the design process suggest that we think outside the box. It's like a cliche to, to hear or read that. Instead of thinking outside the box, for conversational interfaces, we need to destroy that uh, imaginary box that we, we have and build something around tone, style, technique, and voice. So in order to do that, traditional thinking won't help us because we're not building a visual interface. We might have a visual interface for the conversation, but our, uh, our main selling point is going to be a conversation. So we need to write a screenplay. It's uh, similar to uh, like uh, working with a script or uh, not a, a software script, but a, a script with uh, several actors. We need to focus on the several parts of our conversation, which role will be playing each one of the participants, the user, and the software that we're developing, and write all that in a form of a screenplay. In this way, it will be easier for us to describe the flow that the user will be taking. We might be used to write uh, or understand or use mockups and understand flow for our apps, but for conversational interfaces, although there are flows similar because the interface is different, a screenplay is needed. And there are several basic principles that we put in practice every time we have a conversation that for some reason, it's, uh, there are not obvious when developing for a chatbot or other conversational interface. The first one and the most obvious is turn taking. If we're having a conversation, in some moment we're going to be speaking, and at the next we're going to listen for the other party to speak. Also, context is really important. Mostly that's, that's why we have a program in languages and we don't program in a natural language because of context. Computers are terrible understanding context. For some reason, we have not been able to develop something to make computers understand context, but uh, humans, we are good with context. Also, threading and reading between the lines. This is something that's, um, that's a challenge, mostly because when we're having a conversation, there are several channels, but um, usually it's not the same having a conversation in person, let's say at the conference, this might be a great chance for uh, a lot of people to meet in real life, or having the same conversation over Twitter or, or over an IM app. So when we're having a, a, a conversation face-to-face -face in real life, usually we can get some cues from, from our uh, body language. But when having the same conversation over Twitter or social media or uh, instant messaging app, we don't have those cues. The natural replacement is using some emojis. But uh, still, it's not exactly the same. So when developing the conversational interfaces, it's important to keep in mind the cooperation, much like when we're having a conversation 
we are both in the same boat trying to achieve something. And all these um, traits that I, that I mentioned. Also, there are no errors. And, and this is an important thing to keep in mind. When we're having a conversation, we don't say to the, to the other person, like, uh, no, that's, that's wrong, but not in terms of what you're saying. Uh, I consider it's wrong, but you are saying it wrong. That sound weird, but anyway. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, when we're having a conversation, there are no errors. We might have different point of views, but both parties, or if it's a group conversation, if there are many people involved, are uh, putting something to the table and adding some value to the conversation. There are no errors. In the same way, when dealing with, a, with an app, it's a, either a, a, an Android app or an uh, assistant app, something like uh, Google Home or Alexa, um, if for some reason the device say you are wrong, it's going to be like uh, something hard on the user. Instead of that, we have several branches. If the user, for some reason, doesn't reply what we're expecting, or if the uh, reply is wrong in some way, we're not going to say, that's an error, like uh, what we usually do in um, UI interfaces. Uh, instead of that, we're going to take a different road, a different branch, and show a different part of the flow. This is important to keep in mind. We're not showing like a big uh, red X saying to the user, you're wrong. Instead of that, we're taking a different path. And also, much like real life, interacting with a conversational app sometimes will add some challenges. Some of them might be temporarily, other might be uh, for long term. So we need to consider that there will be some noise, that sometimes both the user or the app will need something to be repeated, and that in some moments we will need a graphical reply, in other moments it will be only audio. So with all this in mind, we need to keep those cues to understand. This is the, like the main goal. We need to understand what the user is trying to say, and we need to be able to provide everything the user needs to understand what our app is trying to say. Understanding is key, and uh, it's, it's interesting, mostly because there are several barriers. When we're working remotely, developing software, that is, on, we're working with teams that are located in several parts of the world, usually we communicate using English. And for many of us, it's not our first language. So we need to deal with a couple of things like accent, like uh, the words and phrases that we're using, like cultural barriers. The same thing might happen here when developing conversational interface. So keep in mind that understanding it's critical, and the users are going to help us. Users are here to do something, to achieve something, and focus on that task instead of focus in using our app. Users know how to talk. Everybody knows how to ask for something. For a uh, conversational interface that might be, uh, let's say, uh, turning the lights on or turning the TV off, and we don't need to be taught how to say that or uh, how to speak to the app. What we might need is a, a little help with the onboarding process. There might be several ways of saying something, so our app should consider all these different options and make the user's life a bit easier. Besides that, users also know what they want, how do they want to be done, and basically we just need to leverage on that, mostly because we share the same goal and we're trying to understand each other. 
As I've said before, the context is really important. The context matters. It's not the same to, uh, might, might not be the same to say the same phrase in two different contexts. We are basically good to make a, to infer this context, but as I've said, the computer, it's not as good as humans, so we need to deal with this. If we're having a conversation it, uh, and someone pops in, it's uh, like a bit easier to get into track and understand what's happening. But that context might lead us to different directions. So if we don't have like a clear uh, understanding of what's the goal, if the user is not understanding what the app is trying to say in this context, things are not going to work out. And it's important to have a backup plan in, in cases when uh, something happening, like the user is not replying, um, there's important to have a timeout. When we're having a, a, a conversation, that, it's funny because if we're having a conversation face to face, because we are um, doing this in a synchronous way, the timeout that we have, it's almost non-existent. I mean, if we're speaking face to face and for some reason I say something and the other person just stares at me, it's, it's going to be awkward, right? Sometimes when we're having a conversation, we're, we're thinking about something and it might, uh, we might spend a couple of seconds like thinking like, mm, I don't remember this, and it's quite common. But when we're having the same conversation over, uh, let's say, an I am app, like WhatsApp, that's not synchronous. So we might have to wait for a while, and it's okay. When we're dealing with a, with a conversational interface, usually it's synchronous, but the user might not reply because something happened, like, uh, some interruption, like someone appear and start a conversation in person with me, or I'm dealing with something, and the app is still waiting for some input. In this case, we're going to deal with uh, some timeout, and that's just one example, but it's important to keep in mind that having a backup plan might let us into a, a, a good path, might bring us back into the happy path of the use of, of our app. Um, here's an example. This is a um, sample dialogue with the Google Home and an app called Number Genie. You are supposed to guess a number between uh, zero and 100. In this case, user says nothing, like around here, and the reply from the app is, I didn't hear a number. It's not an error. It's not you are wrong, it's I didn't hear. That might be because noise, because you didn't say anything, or because any reason. But that, that's what I meant with uh, when I say there are no errors. Then it's silent or muffled. It might happen that there's too much noise, or maybe it's not the user speaking, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a dog barking or something. So the next reply is, if you're still there, what's your guess? The wording, the phrases, the tone, it's really important for, for the conversation to be in the happy path. We need to provide the canonical happy path, but consider all these possible branches. And also, we need to consider that it might be a first-time experience or a return user. We already know how to have a conversation, but we might need a bit of help on an onboarding process or if we have used this app several times, we would like to, uh, we will appreciate for our expertise to be considered from the app. This is another uh, example. This is um, for the game to quit. In this case, the user tried to guess 21 right here. It's not 21, so the user g give up. In this case, the app should catch that the user is giving up, quitting, and give like a, a good ending for the conversation. Sure, I'll tell you the number anyway, it was 90. Besides that, I would like to provide some snacks. 
Some people call these best practices. I think uh, each one of these bullets might imply a discussion, so that's why I'm calling that, uh, all of these snacks. And um, I will be happy to discuss any ideas that you have after the, the talk. But let's review some of these ideas on how we are going to be able to build something nice and pretty when we don't have exactly some graphical interface. Um, we should avoid written language. This is important, mostly because when we are developing a graphical UI, usually we focus on some wording that we're used to see in a written way. In this case, we might have a supporting graphical interface, but the main interface is going to be a conversational one, just uh, maybe with the, with the assistant, with the Google Assistant that is, we might have some um, feedback on the app, on the phone, but usually it's just the voice from the assistant speaking to us. Um, it's important to kick, kick off the conversation in a good way. Mm, we need to keep a balance on engaging with the user, but not so much that we're going to nag the user. And it's something similar with the, with the notifications. For, for maybe about three or four years, I've been living without notifications. And uh, it's an interesting experience with the new uh, Do Not Disturb mode in Android. Uh, it's been easier for me to configure that on my phone. But for some apps, I leave the notifications on, like Maps mostly when I'm traveling, but lately I've been getting so many notifications from apps that I ended up blocking the app. So with this in mind, the idea here is to engage with the user just in the correct amount of interactions. We also will, will need to guide the user through the conversation, although we're not like explaining how to have a conversation, nor we are like, uh, leading all the conversation will just guiding. And keep our text-to-speech interactions short and clear, just in case the user is not able to understand for any reason. Um, it, it's also a good idea to avoid any data points unrelated to the user query. Usually, when we're having a conversation, we like to be on a direct path. Many people, like me, uh, tend to ramble when, when speaking. So when having a conversation with someone who rambles a lot, it's a good idea to, to stay in the path. The same thing with, the, with a conversational interface. We should not ramble. We should just give the user whatever they need for this query, for whatever they're trying to achieve. And follow the natural turn taking in order to keep the conversation like something that we will have with a, with a person. It's also a good idea to use conversational makers to keep the user engaged. And finally, with all this solved, we're going to add some salt to our app. with some machine learning. Um, as the abstract said, we don't need to deal anymore with NLP. Ba basically, everything is solved. Everything, let's say. Um, and there are many tools that help us dealing with the language processing. So instead of developing like the whole stack of recognizing the input for the conversation to happen, we can use a tool a framework like Dialogflow. There are many other options. For me, this, this is one of the best available tools. And basically, Dialogflow works with two things, intent matching and entity extraction. It's going to categorize whatever the user is trying to achieve into an intent. And also, it's going to identify something that's relevant for that task to be achieved. In order to do that, or in order to do the, uh, take the next step, we're going to take those intent and entities and do something with that, and eventually reply to the user. Basically, the flow is this. The user is going to input something, either 
uh, with a keyboard, a microphone, and that's going to turn into a query. Dialogflow is going to receive that query, identify the intent, and process it. Might be with something simple, like a um, uh, Firebase Cloud Function, or uh, AWS Lambda, or whatever you would like to use for serverless, or it might be something more uh, complex with your own backend. Either way, we're going to have external APIs, maybe a database, some code to do this processing, and when we have all this settled, we're going to reply to the user and provide a fulfillment with actionable data. The idea here is that Dialogflow is doing all the heavy lifting, and we only need to identify what the user is trying to achieve, what's the main goal, and which pieces of data are relevant to that goal. We're going to start with an invoke procedure. We need to say hello and start experience with the agent, with the software that we're building, our app. In Dialogflow, we're going to define these intents. Um, this is um, just an example, an intent for uh, movie recommendations. And we need to provide training phrases. Like, I want to watch something, or tell me what to watch, or recommend me a movie. These are different ways of saying the same thing. The idea here is to get a movie recommendation. Then we need to provide the entities. In this case, it's a movie. And we're going to provide some synonyms. Like, uh, for sci-fi, we don't have a synonym. But for comedy, we have like funny movies. Or for drama, we have like serious movies. And eventually, we're going to use that webhook data that I mentioned before with a backend to provide the fulfillment. The response is also specified here because we are providing the user something uh, like a, a phrase. Keep in mind that we're doing a conversation here. We're not just providing some unconnected pieces of data. We are having a full conversation here. So the response might be, you should give it a try and watch a comedy. Grab the popcorn, it's movie night, just in case uh, the user is looking for a random recommendation. Or how about a sci-fi for tonight? We use a context to move between intents. Might be that the user is looking forward for something more than just a movie recommendation. Maybe would like to discuss like uh, a specific, a specific uh, actor or actress. Uh, or maybe the user is looking for a recommendation like uh, based on movies that they have already seen before. With this context in mind, we can achieve more fluent conversations. Instead of uh, one request and reply, it's a conversation that's going to be, uh, is going to take many turns between the app and the user and eventually provide some recommendation, but with all the context shared between those interactions. One of the main things that uh, I was looking forward and Google recently launched at the, at the I.O. is that using the, the Google Home, it's really nice, but you need to say, OK, Google, or hey, Google, for each one of the requests. Now they are launching this new feature for you to not say that in every request, just to start a new conversation. And finally, this is all the code that we're going to see. Um, in order to integrate this into our Android app, we need to use an AI service. We're going to be using an access token. Dialogflow, it's not that different from other API providers. It got its own SDK. It also uh, needs some registration, provide an access token. Uh, in this case, we're going to uh, click a button and listen for input. And afterwards, this is the result. And here we're just showing what um, the app is providing. We have a query, we have an action, we have uh, several parameters. And all this depends on whatever we configure on Dialogflow. It's, uh, it's interesting for me mostly because we are dealing with, uh, with configuration. Not everything is done in, in code, although if you really like to code, this might sound like different, 
but uh, it's like a, a trend that I've been, seeing for, uh, I've been seeing for a while, that it works better if some parts of the process are just configuration, like defining the uh, intents and identifying the entities, and other parts of the process are dealing with uh, both the input and the output with code. And basically, that's all that we need in order to deal with, um, with our interaction with Dialogflow. It supports several languages, and it provides uh, several more features tha than what I cover here. So to summarize, many of the ideas behind conversational interfaces are things that are, have been around for a while. Many of the things that are um, useful are quite intuitive. So in order to build an app that got some conversation in any point for any goal for the user, we need to keep in mind that it's important to build a persona using tone, words, phrases, and uh, the technique that we would like for that conversation. There are no errors. There's the happy path and many other paths. So we need a backup plan in order to get the user back in track in case anything happens. The user is there to help us, already knows how to have a conversation, already knows how to achieve things. We need to leverage on that. And basically, the idea here it's having a screenplay, a script for a couple of interactions. If it's your first approach, I would suggest writing at least three different scenarios, the happy path, and then considering several options in order to build the full screenplay that we're going to have. And there are many other small things like avoiding um, written language, keeping the text-to-speech to shortest interactions, but mainly the idea here is make the experience the most um, wonderful that we can build for the user. So that was what I had. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Because we still have time. Over there. Do you? Perfect. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I was just curious about uh, if you have a conversational interface, would the, what, what, what was going to happen with all the flows, with the existing flows that you have? Because it basically leaves us with no job. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, it really depends on what are, what are we uh, looking forward to? I mean, there are several things that are going to be automated, um, but I don't see this happening uh, as quick as uh, for all the fields or for some fields. Um, this might be not completely related to the presentation, but in my opinion, in a couple of years, software development is not going to be as good as it's now in terms of uh, wages mostly because many things are going to be automated, but it's not the only job that's going to, to change. It's not going to disappear, it's going to change. So with that in mind, many of our, the, uh, the apps that we're developing nowadays are going to have something like a conversational interface inside. So it's going to integrate with the, with the flow that we already have. Let's say uh, we're building a, a movie recommendation app. So right now there are like, a, uh, a screen with several buttons and images. Instead of that, we're also going to have first uh, maybe a small button that says chat with someone, and it's going to be that uh, agent recommending movies. Eventually, it's going to be like 50-50, and eventually, if anything goes like the way it uh, seems going now, it's going to be like fully automated with a conversational interface. I'm not sure it's going to happen. I mean, chatbots are, have been around for a couple of years that are not as adopted as I would have thought, but uh, those are my, my ideas in the, in the coming future.